So now I'm going to put on my navy hat, which will have a DOD flavor. You already heard from Susan. You've heard from the DARPA perspective. In a little bit, you'll hear from my sister service, the Air Force. Uh, the th one thing the three of us will agree on is that our sister service, the Army, we love them dearly, but they're one of those strange cousins we never want to talk about. Okay. Okay. So we go there. So I'll kind of talk DOD. So when we talk about families, we are probably one of the largest dysfunctional families in the, in the country. But we'll get there. So Navy, if you do want to send me an email or have a question or something, that's an L in the middle of Robert and Smith. Okay. The six is very important because if you drop that off in the email, you're now conversing with a lawyer. Okay. Um, he usually will send things around to me, but it'll save a step. So the Navy Department, why do we do SBIR? You have solutions to our technical challenges. That's as simple as it gets. Okay. We'll get into it. The Navy aligns our SBIR, STTR program to address our acquisition needs. So it's a big Navy. If you notice, there's a six after my name, which means within 338,000 people in the Department of the Navy, I'm only the seventh person in the email system. So when you say, do I know John Smith, I know a lot of them. Okay? And many times, I don't know the Mary you're speaking of that you saw. So it's a big organization. We try to know things. Acquisition driven, about $300 million goes into our SBR, STTR program. It's growing, thank you, Congress. Okay, and we'll get to the topics. In the Navy, a couple things we believe in, and one of them is we, the Navy, succeed when you succeed. Because if you have that technical solution, we need to be able to produce it on time and on cost. So, if you can't get there and take your one prototype and turn it into 3,000 production models, we haven't succeeded. So what do we do in the Navy? Boots to boats. We do it all. We run small cities called aircraft carriers. We run small cities called base camps. Okay. So even though last time I checked, Arizona's landlocked, right? Maybe the Colorado River, but it's pretty much a trickle when it gets south. Okay. You still have our solutions to the Navy who is around the world. Okay. I forgot to ask, how many people in this room have had a phase one or phase two SBIR? Okay. Those that haven't got one, look around. Those are the people you need to talk to. Okay. They already have the answers. I'm sitting down. <laughs> so when we talk about a Navy salute, I'll go this way. Who has the second largest Navy in the world? You've been to my presentation before, haven't you? <laughs> okay. Oh, be that way. Okay, who has the second largest Air Force in the world? I'll give you some options. Coast Guard, U.S. Army, U.S. Navy. Navy. U.S. Army has the second largest Air Force in the world. So addressing a <coughs> Navy topic many, many times will I have applicability to my sister services and my sister agencies. Okay. Here is my, I like to call it my mall, uh, wall chart, or mall chart. So especially for the guys here, you've been directed to go buy a pair of shoes at the mall. How do we do it, gentlemen? Most of the time we go wander for a while, don't we? If we had been smart, we would have gone to the information kiosk and asked them what stores carry shoes. And then we would have gone to those stores and asked someone, where's the shoe department? So in your case, do you want to go wander the mall until you get your answer, or would you like to start and work your way through? So I can direct you to the stores. So there are my commands that do SBI or STTR. I can help get you to the right door. Then you still have the question, when you get to that store or that command, where's the right door within there? Your call, do you want to spend all weekend doing a web search and hopefully you get the person, or just come to the front door and ask us the question? 
Why do you want to participate? Why do you want to participate? You all keep hearing about how fun contracts are in the federal government. Some of the reasons. And I'll stop here for a second. We always seem to be picking on contracts. And I don't mean to be. They're an incredibly dedicated people that have been hamstrung by rules established by our thing called the Constitution, okay, that says we will do things in a certain way to make sure your tax dollars are spent to the maximum effective and efficient use. Okay. So it's not how do I change the rules within the federal acquisition regulations, it's how do I operate within that rule set. That's how we make our progress. Okay. Data rights, incredibly important to you. How many of you want to give away your intellectual property? Raise your hand. It's a pretty good business model okay, for a day or so. Okay. SBIR, you maintain your data rights for five years after the completion of that contract. How long is that period? Well, think about it. If I get a phase one and it takes nominally 12 months, my IP is there for six years, okay, on and on and on. If I do a procurement contract and it takes me five years to deliver that product to the Navy, I now have protected my IP for 10 years. Okay. Using credit cards and mortgages in the house, probably, I won't ask you to raise your hands who's done that, but you know, many an entrepreneur has. People always, you know, not always, but a lot of people will come up to me and say, I have this technology, does the Navy need it? And my answer will be, I don't know. Because literally, I don't know what my commands need, but there they are. I can help get you to the place. I've got an operational background, so I have an idea which for warfighter may be interested in it. I can generally direct you to the command that might want your technology, but I don't know if it's a priority today. Okay. Or in many cases, how would I integrate it? But we'll have a conversation. It just depends on how, where you want to start the conversation and how effective a conversation we might have. Okay. Once I bend things, I've incorrectly categorized them, have I not? Because is it a material topic? Or is it a coding topic? Or is it a cyber topic? They're all related, so you really have to read the topics to see if your technology will fit. But that gives you an idea of where the Navy's been with topics. We'll get this in a second. So let's say you're pretty astute at tracking Navy topics. And you've seen since FY10, uh, topic generated within your technology area. FY10 it's been there, FY11 it's been there, FY12 it's been there, FY13. In FY14 you no longer see that topic within the solicitation. Why? Two reasons. Either I've solved the technical challenge or it's no longer a priority for the SBIR program. What you don't see up front in an issue topic is the family food fight for those top topics. It's the mo may very well still be a priority to that program manager, but they lost out in the vetting prioritization within the Navy. Remember, he or she still has 97% of their budget to spend. They may still be working on that issue. It just may, might, may not have made it on the SBIR solicitation. So track it, see where you're at, ask questions. Okay, I'm going to blank the chart and we're going to have a test. So what do you want to take away from this? I guess the biggest one is look at how many proposals to awards. It's an exceedingly competitive program. Because here we go, on a nominal topic, it's hard to do this by the year because there's much, very much a temporal 
element to this because the life of a topic is five to seven years. So the moment you get awarded your phase one, is that the time to go order your yacht? Maybe not, because it's going to be five to seven years before you're a viable phase three producing product kind of a company. Okay. So in a typical year, about 170 topics between my three solicitations. Okay. 2,800 proposals. Who wants to do the math? I believe that's one in six, right? Okay. Not everybody gets there. Of those 482 topics, remember when I talked about how I'm going to probably do a two to one down select? So what happened when I went to phase two? I picked 255 awards, kind of a two to one ratio there as it goes. And from that you'll see about half of those will end up being a phase three topic. Someone else is going to spend money on either continuing the development of your technology or you're ready to be procured. We in the Navy, for want of a better metric, and we're trying to find one, track how many SBIR dollars we invest versus the next person writing a check to you. Okay. That tells me that we're doing the right thing, that there's demand for your solutions. What you don't see up front, when we get a Navy topic, one of the first things we ask that technical point of contact, that TPOC, is if it works, where is it going to go? We're asking actually two people. One, that TPOC, where is it going to go? Because it should be going into acquisition into one of our platforms, our systems. Okay. The other person we ask is you, because one of the sections on your proposal is your plan for commercialization slash transition. Okay. Where is it going to go if it works? Which is kind of difficult. If you're new to the Navy, how do you know where your algorithm is going to fit within the decision support system that's on the command operations computer inside the combat operations center on board the carrier. You've all got 30 years of Navy experience, right? You should know these things. Come on. Okay. But we start asking those questions up front. We talked about 11 agencies in the federal government. Within the Department of Defense, there are 11 components, services, depending on how they want to categorize us in the day. Some days the Navy is a component, some days I'm an agency. Okay. Within the Navy, I have seven commands that do it slightly differently. And so you need to understand our charts as to when we will be giving you a check. Cash flow is kind of important to a small business, isn't it? Okay. Should SBIR slash STTR be your primary and only source of income? Great non-answer. Absolutely not. We're part of your business, but don't make us your only business because I've got to tell you, working with the federal government is not really smart most days. Okay. We're part of your package, part of the solution. But we go through a phase one, phase two, subsequent phase two, sometimes you'll hear them as 2.5, sometimes you'll hear them as commercial readiness program. All that is is we've got more SBR dollars to help you progress just a little further. Because remember, I'm always trying to get you to where someone goes, yo, barely, I want it. Okay? Sometimes I'll do that by cost sharing. Sometimes I'll do it just by paying for it to continue the technology development. It was mentioned before, technology readiness level. If you don't know what that is, you need to Google it and you need to download that chart. It's one of the best products that ever came out of NASA. It helps us all have a level playing field on talking on the state of your technology. I'll also tell you that a TRL plus or minus one is worth a cup of coffee. Because what you believe to be a TRL five, in some places it will be a six. In other places, it'll be a four. So we need to talk, but at least it gives us a, a, a basis for having that initial conversation. We talked about the money phases there. You see the TRL levels as we're going along. Very important to us. 
the key for us normally is right here, the sweet spot. Somewhere at that, we always hear TRL6 is when I'm going to get acquisition interested in you. Somewhere that's about when that acquisition PM who is working cost schedule performance is ready to accept the risk of continued research and development of your technology. Okay. Prior to that, they really don't want to talk to you. They're busy. Okay. But we've got folks that want to progress this technology and a lot of PMs understand that you don't get the next thing that never existed off the shelf. I want to talk about Emily for a second. So look here, you're the right side of the screen. As we speak today, Emily is being employed by lifeguards throughout the world. She's being employed in the United States by fast water rescue organizations. She was just recently used in Houston during their flooding. Okay. Kind of a robotic lifeguard. You can see what she can do. That company is an Arizona company, Hydronolix. Okay. They have their own website. Tony Mulligan sat in this, a room like this, probably not this very room, but a room like this probably about 20 years ago when he was a graduate student at the University of Arizona, writing his proposals in his one little one-bedroom apartment with his wife. Okay. Tony's a great guy. Okay. He is the creator, inventor, and producer of Emily's. But let's back up a few years. The technology is Technologies in Emily derived from an unmanned air vehicle that Tony's company produced for the U.S. Navy for use by special, special forces in the Marines. Interesting. And you'll hear a little bit how that same technology in those UAVs are still being used in UAVs today. So his technology split off in two different directions. Okay. Prior to that, Tony's first award with the Navy was an STTR with the Office of Naval Research to work on sensors to assist in well migration. Emily is a overnight success, 15 years in the making. Have you not heard that phrase before, how long it takes to develop technology before it gets out there commercially? Okay. If you ask Tony, did he ever envision Emily in any of his slots? No. That's not where he's going. Not really what the Navy needed. Because there's a sad part to this story. Because the tortured acronym EMILY also stands for the name of his daughter's best friend, who died drowning because the lifeguard couldn't get to her in time. So being the smart man, Tony says, I'm going to work on that challenge. And that's where EMILY came from. So. Sometimes you're going to need to think broader. It's very difficult when you've got the blinders on and you're staring at that piece of paper in front of you or the last test didn't succeed where there may be applicability for my technology. So just keep that back in the mind that sometimes you've got to step back. What does the Navy do for tools for the SBR STTR program? One of them is the STP, the transition program. So we already talked about how difficult it is to get a phase one in the Navy. And then you're still batting 50% to get to phase two. But if you make it to phase two, I am going to invite you to the STP program. Because at that point, now we're starting to get serious about our relationship with you. And one of the first questions I ask you when you show up to STP is, what are you going to do if your phase two is successful? Do you realize when I do that every year, half the companies have never asked themselves that question? Because if it works, and that TPOC, and that program manager goes, I love it, I need 3,000 of them next year. But I need 300 delivered next month. So do you build your factory? Do you outsource it? Do you know how many small businesses have subcontractors who are prime contractors? Interesting concept, that a Raytheon would work for me. You write them a big enough check, they will. And maybe they can produce for you, and you send them the, the specs, and they slap your sticker on a finished product. 
That's FST. CRP is just understand that's one of my pots of money to modify behavior, either by additional research to get the product done, or I'm going to cost share with that program office who is cost schedule performance. They're always underfunded. So if he can get his technology at a cheaper cost, i.e. I help pay for it, they say, yes, I'll go with it. Schedule. SBIR authorities allow me to cut out part of that contracts challenge we talked about. When it takes two to three years to get a contract, I'm not meeting schedule. But if I can take a phase two contract and issue a subsequent contract in less than six months. And in some cases, if I'm really, really, really serious, I can do that in 30 days. Cost, schedule, performance. Okay. Does it work within that equation? Phase three guidebook. I talked about the authorities. 338,000 people in the Navy don't understand all of the SBIR authorities out there. Are you surprised? I have contracts officers who went to school. It usually takes about 24 months to make you a, no kidding, qualified contracts officer and they give you the technical warrant that says, I can sign contracts on behalf of the United States of America. And I've been trained, if I do anything wrong, if I don't dot one I or cross every T, I'll go to jail. They tend to be very conservative people. So just. If you were to look in their office behind them, somewhere about 10 feet high, 8 feet wide, is a bookshelf full of the FAR. I make a little tiny handbook that has the excerpts that is saying, this is exactly where your authorities are. No more homework needed. My job was to make their job easier, and guess what? I get phase three contracts out faster. I do believe one of my sister services took the cover off of my manual and slapped their cover on it, and I'm good with that. And we have a search tool, and we're going to get to that. NavyCiverSearch.com. It's free. You're not required to register. But what can you do with this thing? You, if I had a laser, can put your technology up here, cloud-based. It will give you other phrases. You can down-select. It will show you every topic the Navy's had since the start of the program. And there's a lot of different data elements there. But if you've narrowed it down to your technology and you get, instead of having, what is that, 3,909 things, you get your top 10. Within that, you can see kind of an abstract, the unclassified abstract of what was expected, what was done. You also get the technical point of contact within the Navy. You can call that person. You can't talk about an active topic but you can talk, how has your technology gone? Have you made progression? Where's your challenges? Maybe we can have a conversation. The other person you're getting out to get is if it's been awarded, is you'll get the company in their point of contact. There may be a teaming chance for you because you may have the technical solution to one of their challenges on their overall effort. Okay. It's a great, powerful tool. Question, can you write a topic for the Navy, SBIR program? Yes or no? How many yeses? How many noes? How about it depends? Okay. No, you cannot. The only person that can submit topics for the Navy, SBIR, STR solicitation will be a government employee. Their name will be on here is my topic. But wait a second. Where did Billy get his topic? Either he thought it up on his own, he talked to other government engineers, scientists on the challenges as they tweaked it, or he may have talked to industry to understand what the state of the art is. So you can help them do their job, remember they're overworked, underloved, and definitely underpaid, they can take what you hand them, tweak it, morph it to where it matches what they need, and then submit it. So you can have that conversation. Up until when it becomes an official topic, we're in the federal acquisition regulation process, and all of a sudden the curtains close and I can't talk to you. 
That only happens after the solicitation hits the street. So there's plenty of time to talk, either about a current solicitation or of a future solicitation. Points of contact. And it can be a challenge. So I may be working on a material for my Naval Sea Systems Command. And how many people know who NAVC is? OK. Obviously, well, sit down. NAVC does ships and submarines. But within the Navy, they also do boots and little tiny boats. So don't be wrapped up that, oh, well, I only need to look at this command because they're the only ones that deal with my technology. Search the database, look at the solicitation, see where there may be cross-pollination on what you're doing. So many times, your algorithm may work for more than one command. Okay? Your technical approach may have a primary target, but in the back of your mind, you're also thinking about, how am I going to morph, it, morph that next year for the next platform? Okay? Because believe it or not, every one of these PMs doesn't know that they have a counterpart in another program somewhere. Okay. The number of times I've had a person say, I am a DDG 51 person. Well, last time I checked, a boat's a boat, isn't it? They get really upset when I do that, by the way, really upset. But there could be applicability to my carrier community. Once again, 30,000 people, they may not pass each other in the hallway and know what they're up to. But there they are. There's a website. Look for more information, topics, and more. I think that's it, unless you have questions for the Navy or writ large DOD. I'll try to do my best. Have I underwhelmed you, overwhelmed you? Answered every question you had. Yes, sir. Absolutely not. It's your patent. It's your intellectual property. What I get is a, let me get the phrase correct, I get government, is it unlimited or limited rights? Depends. Government persons, purpose rights for your technology. And I've got to protect your intellectual property. I, okay, I go to jail if I don't protect your intellectual property. So no, but it belongs to you. Yes, ma'am. I would like to say it's never, ever happened, but that would be wrong. But when it does happen, guess what? We go to court. Guess what? Normally, our lawyers will say, guess what? You, TPOC, violated the law. We're going to write a check to this company, and I think maybe we've truncated your career. OK? They're not supposed to. It happens. Usually, I'd say eight out of 10 times when it does happen, and we're talking it happens maybe once every three or four or five years. But over the history of that time, 80% of those would just be they didn't understand what they were doing. It, wasn't, uh, it was by omission, not commission, when they did something like that. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, if the, the small business has a patent already for the process of the algorithm, and then they would like to apply that to the Navy, <coughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Then what will happen? The, 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 pro, the, the small business will have to license that, or they have to develop some kind of joint venture. What, what is the process? Yes, no, maybe. It all depends on what you negotiate. Okay, but you brought a solution to me. It's your intellectual property. It stays your intellectual property. The question is, did I take that and did we modify it, improve it, whatever? It still gets. Now, do I have to get a new patent for the new product? So what do? And then do I have government limited? rights for what we developed or what I paid to be developed at that point. So once again, I'm not a patent attorney, so I will most likely be talking out of turn if I mention something. That's when you have the conversation to make sure you've got yourself covered and protected. Okay, But you, I, just because you put in a proposal, I go, oh, I love that idea. Let me steal it. The federal acquisition has rules about where I will go to jail and what color suit I'll wear. Yes, sir. Now, I've heard it said at uh, SBIR training programs that if you've got a patent, it's not innovative anymore because the innovation is done. And so you don't qualify for 
applied to the FBIR program. Is that the way you view things? Well, you've got two different concepts here between our, why you couldn't apply to the SBIR program versus is your patent still patentable? Okay, two different things. You can still apply. Can I use that technology in a new novel way for whatever the new challenge is? Okay. I won't go into whether or not the patent office is gonna go, guess what, your, your patent is, the rules come with that. The question is whether or not you're gonna get a patent issued on what they believe not to be new technology. Okay. No, I, the question I'm asking is if you've got an issued patent, but uh -huh. you still have to develop this further uh -huh. down the road, are, are you um, able to get a phase one or not? Which oh, absolutely. SBIR is Small Business Innovation mm -hmm. Research. Yeah. Actually, in most so cases... People say that once you've got a patent, it's not innovation anymore. we're gonna get in the coffee, is your patented technology applied to my challenge, the new and novel approach? That's probably gonna be the question. Did you solve my tech, you know, did your phase one fee, proof of feasibility proposal address my need? Okay. How innovative it is or needs to be will depend on what my challenge is, my temporal period of when I need to solve that challenge. Do I have 10 years to solve the problem? Is it a basic research problem? Or do I need that solution yesterday because lives are at stake? Okay. Because the closer I get to being a TRL 7 or 8, it's pretty mature at that point. If anything, I'm probably addressing how do I do a form fit function to take that technology and insert it into a program. So it all depends. Last chance before I get pulled off the stage. Any more? Thank you for the, I'll be here until 11ish tomorrow. So if you didn't get on the schedule but you'd like to talk, please come see me. Okay. Just a reminder: we have the flyers for the FBI. the flyers for the form form for ST. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you want to come to DC. May 16th through 18th in yeah. DC area. Yeah. All right, in case you didn't hear that, we do have some flyers on the table in the back uh, about, you guys have something coming up? <coughs> Navy conference in DC? Is it working again? I talked about our STP program, uh, which is about a 10 month program. Think of it going for scientists and engineers being a very aggressive program, masters in business. And the culmination of that 10 months is that company and your technology will go to a conference and be on display for all of the Navy to see. Uh, what's different this year, we've co-located with Sierra and Space. And you probably don't know who they are. They're the Navy League, but it is the preeminent maritime conference in the United States. And I'm scared silly because my tiny little companies are going to be across the hallway by these behemoth elephants called primes. Okay. I think it's a great opportunity that both communities will be able to speak to each other. Because when I go over to the Sierra Space, when I see the Boeings and the Bells and the Raytheons and the BAEs and the Lockheed Martins and the Ingalls Shipyards and the rest of them, what I tell them is, have you gone over to see the Navy's newest partners? because those phase two technologies are next door. And the number of times my little company says, I produced a solution for NAFC, but I had conversations with six or seven other program managers from other commands, and I never realized there was applicability. And I've got more partners now. Okay. Or guess what? Lockheed Martin likes me a lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember, yeah, it's a side story, but I remember doing a tour through the Joint Strike Fighter production line down in Texas. And as we were going through a little golf cart, because it's only like six or seven football fields long, every time he stopped and says, there is an SBIR solution to our production problem. So, once again, it works. But FST is their graduation exercise for, as a phase two. And one of the things we're looking for is where's the next step and where they're going to go. Okay, kind of neat.